One day, in the highest mountains on Earth, a hunter was chasing a snow leopard. In his mad rush, he came upon a glacier. Exhausted and parched, he picked up a piece of heavenly blue-colored ice to quench his thirst. But the ice would not melt, even when he warmed it in his hands. He had just discovered the first aquamarine on Mount Shumabakar in the dramatic Karakoram mountain range of northern Pakistan. Lawrence Bomer is a jeweler in the exclusive Place Vendôme in Paris. Born in America of German nationality, he studied as an engineer in France. This unusual training allows him to explore new avenues and dream up the most wildly imaginative pieces of jewelry without getting bogged down in the technique. We create a lot of jewelry using precious stones of all colors that we set with ball bearings and also plant-like shapes. We particularly like aquamarine. It's hard to find good quality specimens. You judge its quality by the transparency and the intensity of its color, and the best mines are in Pakistan. Pakistan is a young state, founded on August 14, 1947. This new Muslim nation attracted 7 to 8 million people from India during the partition with a similar number of Hindus migrating in the opposite direction. The civilization of this country dates back several thousand years before Christ. In the 16th century, the Mughals founded a dynasty which gave the country magnificent buildings, mosques and palaces, but also fabulous legends about the precious stones of this land. At the start of the 17th century, the first English merchants, attracted by the dynasty's riches, began to seek concessions from the court of the great Mughal Ahangir. The decline of the Mughal Empire corresponded with the rise of British influence. Today, these mineral resources are underexploited, and it is in the mountains surrounding the Indus that the most beautiful gems can be found. The rubies, emeralds, sapphires, but most importantly, the unbelievable aquamarine crystals. The road to the aquamarines closely follows the Karakoram Highway, known as the KKH. For more than 2,000 years, this former Silk Road has been a vital link between China and Pakistan. The KKH winds through the arid gorges of Kohistan. The inhabitants of this area are largely descended from notorious bandits who sought refuge in these rocky mountains. Anyone wanting to cross this region must therefore take a guard with them. Quite apart from the climatic and seismic problems of the area, bandits like the fearsome Chilasi have long been a major obstacle to communications all along the Indus. Other tribes used to avoid crossing this region, and even today it still has a certain reputation. At the end of a long, unpaved road, you come to Skardu. The atmosphere is tense in this windswept town, which lies just a few dozen kilometers from Jammu Kashmir, the source of the never-ending conflict between India and Pakistan. This town is known for its dealers who collect the gems mined in the surrounding mountains. Uh, did you have a comedy? This stone is of very poor quality. These dealers' first response is to offer extremely poor samples at astronomical prices to test the potential buyer. Did you have best on big pieces? After some deliberation, he decides to get some advice from his colleagues before showing off his real treasures. The reply seems positive. 
The rustic appearance of these workshops is meant to deceive people who know little about the world of precious stones. The real showroom, reserved for the initiated, is far more discreet. In this well-guarded room, the dealer stores the treasures he has accumulated during the summer months, when the snow on the highest seams melts, allowing the miners to extract the crystals. In actual fact, the real market is not here. This man is just a collector who sends the fruits of his endeavors to contacts in cities in Pakistan where a handful of intrepid foreign clients dare to venture. It's a nice piece. Quartz and aquamarine. A very nice shape. These aquamarine crystals will go to museums or private collectors. The damaged but very pure, intense blue crystals will be sold to be cut. There are several mines in northern Pakistan that supply exceptional aquamarines. Is this aquamarine come from which mine? Mm, sugar, from the sugar, sugar mine. Oh. Sugar, sir. Nice piece. Uh, and it's possible to see the mine of sugar? The sugar mine is closed because of the snow, but the Shumar Bakar mine is open. I can introduce you to someone there. It's the iron in aquamarine that makes it blue. It also contains silica, aluminium, and beryllium, a rare metal so hard and resistant to high temperatures that it is used in alloys for aircraft. Let me introduce you to Mr. Gulmur Tata. He works in the Chumar Bakar mine and he can take you there and show you around. Hello, my name is Gulmur Tata. I work in Chumar Bakar. I want to see a mine of Akomoin, perhaps Chumar Bakar. It's possible. Chumar Bakar is at a very high altitude. It's extremely dangerous to go there. And I think it would be very difficult for you to get there. It takes two days to reach the Nagar Valley, where the Shumar Bakar mine is situated. The landscape alternates between fertile fields irrigated by glacier streams and deep gorges with the Indus running through them. The Indus River begins its 3,300-kilometer odyssey in Tibet, then crosses Pakistan from top to bottom, and finally flows into the Gulf of Oman. The land it crosses is rich in precious stones and metals, especially gold, which has been carried along the riverbed for centuries. On the riverbanks, nomads seek their fortune in the fine gray sand, of the father of all rivers. Using techniques passed down through the centuries, the men use a sieve to systematically eliminate the large stones in the sand. You have to wash a lot of sand to find just a few grams of gold. The gold-bearing sand falls onto a wooden board. The heaviest pieces remain there. This precious mix is gathered onto a sort of wooden plate called a bati, and the gold, which is the heaviest, settles in the middle. After meticulous washing, the sand is progressively eliminated and the specks of gold begin to appear. 
The specks of gold glean day after day as stored away. Once a sufficient quantity has been collected, they are amalgamated with mercury to form artificial nuggets. They are sold according to their weight. By following the river Hansa up for the last few kilometers, you come to a valley nicknamed Little Paradise, which is dominated by aquamarine mines. The Hansa and Nagar valleys were once ruled by Amir, the all-powerful chief of this peaceful kingdom, which grew rich from its strategic position on the Silk Road. One day, he decided to divide it between his two sons, who became sworn enemies. This war between the two valleys lasted a long, long time, until one night when the son of the Mir of Nagar crossed the frozen river to reach his cousin, the daughter of the Mir of Hunza, with whom he had fallen in love. They had a child called Ayesh, meaning sent from the sky. From that day on, the two valleys have lived together in peace. <laughs> These are our miners. These are old miners. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The mine is at the top. That's it, the mine of Chumar Bakar. How many meters? 5,000 meters. And uh, how many people uh, work in this place? Are, uh, there are maybe 500, almost. Last year, uh, some people have got injured during this explosion, you know. And they are still alive here. Uh, it is quite difficult and dangerous, really. Uh, during this uh, ten-year tenure, the people's uh, destiny has changed because they are earning huge money from uh, the mining. And this is one of the uh, source of, big source of income, marble quarries. The people totally uh, depend on the mining. This is a source of income. Uh, people from this village are not getting jobs. They are, they are not working in other places because they know that they have a mining place. They can get a lot of money from the mines. So they are uh, going to the mining place, Chumarbukor. And this is the only source of income. A long time ago, when Shumabaka was discovered by hunters, only the inhabitants of Sumeya were allowed to exploit the precious stones. At first, there was no need to dig deep tunnels to find the aquamarines. The crystals could be found on the surface after being torn from the rock by erosion. Then people abandoned their jobs in the valley to work in the mine. As the number of prospectors increased, the search for stones became more and more intense. They bought equipment to dig into the mountain. Their efforts were rewarded and they found large quantities of aquamarine. In 1994, an enormous crystal weighing four kilograms was found lying in a fault in the rock on a bed of mica. All the miners had to do was pick it up. It was the most spectacular find since the mine opened. It looks like a mass exodus as the inhabitants of Sumeya make their final preparations before heading up to the mine. Because it is at such a high altitude, the men must take everything with them. Equipment, food and even firewood 
as no trees grow above 3,500 meters. Horses and mules are used to carry the heaviest packages. This is a Shiite area, but pagan beliefs still exist. Before the ascent, Gulmurtaza goes to be blessed by a shaman in the hope of a safe journey. In the mountains of northern Pakistan, at the edge of the formidable glaciers, where delicate plants burst into flower after the winter snows melt, a place exists that is so pure it is beyond the grasp of mere mortals. The village elders say that spirits can be found there, and even today the people of these valleys firmly believe in them. Only the shaman can contact the spirits and appease them, for the slightest thrown stone or the smallest dislodged rock could scare them and incur their wrath. The spirits can set off huge avalanches with just a few claps of thunder. It is often on long journeys into the mountains that the shaman receives messages from the spirits. So there is a close relationship between this man and the spirits, who can give him healing powers and the power to predict the future of those who are undertaking a long journey. To make contact with the spirits, the shaman inhales the smoke of juniper branches until he goes into a trance. By dancing to the sound of the flutes and tambourines, he ascends to the heights where the supernatural beings live. In his ecstasy, he can hear messages from the spirits sent through the music. The ascent to the mine can finally begin. Over the last three years, the men from the village have used the money from the aquamarine to build a road up to the foot of the glacier. This huge project entailed the use of dynamite to blast away the rocks deposited there millions of years ago by the Silkian Glacier. Man's work is only temporary in this environment in a perpetual state of flux. The freezing conditions and a multitude of streams constantly cause landslides that make it impossible for any vehicle to use the road. Confronted with the might of nature, the miners decide to leave the jeep and continue on foot. The villages in this region are havens of peace, soothed by the gurgling brooks of glacier runoff that flow into irrigation canals. Wheat and corn grow here in abundance, but this valley is best known for its succulent apricots, which form the basis of the Hunzikut people's diet. The fruit is dried in July and August to be eaten in the winter months. The Sumeya Valley, dominated by the 7,257 meter high Mount Duran, becomes increasingly hostile and barren the higher you climb. That mountain is Chumar Bakar. The mines are behind it. After the first day of climbing, the party sets up camp at the foot of the Silkian Glacier. 3,500 meters above sea level. It's the last place on the journey where bushes can be found to make a fire. The weather changes fast in the mountains. This is the major risk, and the miners know that.
What do you think? Do we have to go back down? With this bad weather, we can go back down if you wish. We could sleep down there and come back up tomorrow morning. It's difficult to climb up there in this weather. The atmosphere is tense. We have entered the spirit's kingdom, and everyone has lost a loved one on this mountain. The incantations of the shaman must have worked. Several hours later, the clouds clear from the horizon. But superstition persists. Two years ago, a group of men climbed up without the shaman's protection. It was obvious that the spirits did not approve of them looking for aquamarine and were disturbed by their pneumatic drills and dynamite. Incensed by these intruders, they killed them in an avalanche. The hike resumes, but every step becomes heavier and more painful. The further you climb, the less oxygen there is. The group finally arrives at the Shumar Bakar mine. At almost 5,000 meters above sea level, this makeshift village is made up of 70 small houses built of dry stone walls with canvas sheets for roofs. Murtazar picks up the pace because he can't wait to see the aquamarines found in his absence. Every hut houses around 10 men who eat, sleep, and live in cramped and difficult conditions. Murtaza's father is one of the elders who looks after the village when his son goes down into the valley for equipment or to sell stones. He is happy to see his son again because there were some impressive finds while he was away. No wash, huh? No wash. That's Mika. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's Mika. Once it has been cleaned, this stone will be a very intense color. Following the orders of the shaman, each time Murtaza returns, the old man burns juniper branches to purify his house and chase away the evil spirits, which could divert the men from the richest seams of crystals. This time, the old man is harboring a special secret. While his son was away, he found an exceptional stone. No one else has seen it, and it must stay hidden until it is sold in the city. Showing it off could stir up envy among the other men. Aquamarine grows in perfectly hexagonal crystals, which in this mine are particularly large and well-formed. The irregular patches on each side of the crystal correspond to its natural growth. These are a guarantee of its quality and proof that it has not been cut, which would devalue the stone considerably in the eyes of collectors. The exceptional stone found by Murtaza's father remains out of sight. The breathtaking altitude of Shumar Bakar makes it one of the highest mines in the world. The miners tunnel into the enormous white seams that are clearly visible on the mountainsides. This is where the aquamarine is to be found. 65 million years ago, the Tethys Sea was where Pakistan now lies. Then a volcano thrust from the ocean, forming an island that would become Kohistan. The Indian tectonic plate moved gradually under the Asian plate, pushing back the sea. This mighty shift created the highest mountains in the world, the Himalayas and the Karakoram. As the mountains formed, they drew the aquamarine from the bowels of the earth and deposited it close to their summits. Aquamarine is still forming today at the earth's core, 
But while the Karakoram continues to grow a few centimeters higher every year, the erosion of its summit due to atmospheric conditions means the aquamarine is moving closer and closer to the surface. This rock is extremely hard, so blasting with dynamite is the best way to clear away the rock and reach the seams lined with crystals. The men who work in these tunnels have no formal training in using dynamite, and these dangerous techniques result in frequent accidents. The miners drill holes in the rock. The drills don't function well in these conditions where the oxygen is so thin. Then sticks of dynamite are placed in the holes. Then they mark the fuse with a piece of paper so they can find it easily when it's time to light it. You have to be careful in the mine because of the dynamite. We've got to shift this stone. That's it, it's coming away now, and we'll blast away this block. Twenty or so fuses have to be lit, and they are short, so there's no time to lose. One, two, three, four. The miners count the explosions one by one, but this method is approximate, and one explosion can cover another. Let's get him out of there. Once again, the lack of organization and training of these shepherds turned miners has put their lives in danger. Two of the fuses were much slower than the others, and the explosions took place as the men entered the tunnel. One of the men is injured in this lost world without medicine or surgeons. There is just a male nurse to dispense first aid. He was inside the mine during the explosion and a rock hit him on the head. I've put two or three stitches in the wound. He's a little better now. Nothing is allowed to stop the search. The explosions have opened up a pocket of crystals, and for these miners, the aquamarines are more important than their own lives. With extreme care, as if they were handling a newborn child, the miners begin to extract the aquamarine from a fault covered in mica. The contrast between these rough-looking men and the delicate way they extract the fragile crystals is striking. The crystals are often covered in brown iron oxide. Each time a crystal is taken out, the miners say a prayer of thanks. Nature is a capricious beast. It can take months of work to open up a pocket of aquamarine like this. Some tunnels never produce anything. 
Either Gulmultaza or his father is present for every discovery because they have invested the most in this tunnel. At Chumarbakar, there are about 70 to 75 tents, and up to 500 people work there. What is the name Chumarboko? Chumarboko Bakar means the earth, and Chumar is the iron. The ground here is hard like iron, so that's why we named it Chumarbakar. In the early days, there were fewer than 300 people here. And uh, they find easy the stone? At that time, it was easy to find the aquamarine. You didn't need dynamite. You could easily get it out of the ground with just a crowbar. <coughs> now we've formed crews of six or seven men. Each of them has one or several shares of the profits, depending on what he has contributed, whether it be explosives, machines, food, or sheer hard work. As night falls, the call to prayer. But some of the men continue their search deep in the tunnels. The snow melts in June, but there are heavy falls in November, so they have just four months to find their precious booty. For the rest of the time, Shumar Bakar is an inaccessible frozen wasteland. At night, the temperature can fall to minus 20 degrees centigrade. The huts have no heating, and when the men wake up, the insides of the roofs are covered with ice. There's no hot water for a morning wash. The village slowly comes to life, and the men have their tea. It's their only source of heat at this hostile altitude. Sleeping in the huts of Shumabakar is not easy. It's cold, but even worse, it's hard to breathe. The flames of the lamps consume a large part of the oxygen that is so scarce at this altitude. Add to that 10 or so miners sleeping in these cramped little houses and the air becomes unbreathable. The men are close to suffocation and suffer terrible headaches. The men who continued on through the night have found something. They've dug out a beautiful cluster of aquamarines. <laughs> but the substance surrounding the crystals, called gang, is too thick, making this stone too heavy. In this state, it'll be difficult to transport and to sell. One of the miners marks out the parts to be cut off. The gang will be cut away with a diamond edge saw. The job is carefully completed with a hammer and chisel so as not to spoil the appearance of the stone. these modifications is to make the crystals look as good as possible. The next stage is to remove the brown iron oxide, which obscures the deep blue color of the crystals. To do this, the aquamarine is dipped in a hot acid solution, which dissolves the iron oxide. 
After a thorough washing and then rinsing in water, the gem's true colour appears. Several times a week, the men gather in the center of the village to sell their crystals <laughs> according to an ancient tradition that could be called blanket bidding. <laughs> These transactions can sometimes cause quarrels because the miners often overvalue their goods. After all, they risk their lives every day to obtain these natural marvels. The buyer and the seller each put a hand under a blanket spread on the ground. <laughs> The buyer makes an offer by pressing on one, two or three of the seller's fingers. The price depends on the number of fingers involved, following a precise code. Pressing on one finger means an offer of 100 rupees. Pressing on two fingers, one after another, is an offer of 200 rupees. Three fingers equals 300 rupees. And touching two fingers at once is 1,000 rupees. Pressing on three fingers at once means 10,000 rupees. This way, the price is proposed anonymously. The highest bidder gets the stone. These men live in constant danger in austere conditions, without the company of women and children. To settle their disputes in this microcosm cut off from civilization and its laws, they have formed a committee of elders called a jaga. This body makes the decisions that govern the men's lives and such issues as investment in the village. Their word is final when it comes to sorting out arguments between the men of this community. You have called together the elders of the Jirga. Whatever your dispute is, tell us, what is the problem? You know very well that we must not be called every day. We are busy. We have work to do. Today you have called us. Respected elders, we realize we've called you together during your work. Please excuse us. The problem is the borders of the mine that you have laid out. We were working in our mine, on our claim, and we did not go stray over into the other mine. But our neighbor is accusing us of being there. Yes, respected elders, we ask you to meet to hear our dispute. We work our claim and we're honest. But our brothers came onto our side and used explosives and their tools on our claim. There are no good stones in their part of the mine, but there are in ours, which is why they wanted to come onto our claim. Why aren't you speaking? We will not have time to go back over this, so say everything you want to say now. You cannot make a judgment by staying in the tent. You must come and see the mine. It's not in our tradition to argue in our village. We will make a decision, but you must leave the tent until we call you. We must discuss now so we can make a fair and equitable judgment. We must make a decision that is acceptable to both sides so no one can criticize us. Call them back in. The elders of this jirga have decided that you must pay 25% to Chabas, and you can keep the remaining 75%. Now stand up and shake hands. You must stay friends and forget this disagreement. Most conflicts are settled amicably, and there is a great sense of solidarity in this community. 
Thanks to the satellite phone installed a few months ago, Murtazar informs the biggest dealer in Peshawar that he will be coming to see him with an exceptional crystal, probably the one his father found. This treasure has remained hidden. Does it really exist? And is it as special as Murtazar's father says? For now, these questions remain unanswered. Murtazar, visibly in a hurry to sell the stone, sets off for the valley. In the Sumeya Valley, a dealer is ready and willing to buy some of Murtazar's aquamarine. Since they began finding precious stones on the mountain, the life of the people in the village has changed. Some have become miners, but others have gone into trading. They buy the stones to resell them to bigger dealers in Gilgit or Peshawar. Life for the village residents has improved greatly in just a few years. Rather than fritting away their money, they have used it to build schools for their children and health clinics. The price the dealer offers is too low. There will be no deal. Murtazar thinks he can get a better price in Peshawar. Murtazar will not show this dealer his exceptional stone because he thinks it is only worth displaying such a valuable piece to a dealer who can afford it. Murtazar's first stop will be Gilgit, the capital of Pakistan's northern territories. The call to prayer from the ancient mosque mixes with the sound of drums and clarinets accompanying a polo match. In this region, they play an extremely violent version of this sport which originated in Central Asia. Murtazar never misses a chance to watch a match. The best way to get to Peshawar is in one of the trucks that regularly make the journey. The drivers are very experienced and hurtle down the roads along the Indus at hair-raising speeds. These huge vehicles are moving art galleries, covered in paintings that give the driver a feeling of safety. It's all an illusion, because on these roads, one slip could be fatal. For Murtazar, this is the safest way to travel. Transporting precious stones is a risky business in this region, and it is best to avoid using cars or buses full of people who may ask questions. Many men have lost their lives for less, and on this occasion, even more than others. Murtazar has a treasure in his bag that some people would stop at nothing to steal, so he takes great care. <laughs> Murtazar is offering his aquamarine crystals to one of the biggest shops in the city of Mingora. It's an aquamarine. It's a beautiful piece. It's opaque at the bottom, but translucent at to the top. This city is in the Swat Valley, which is renowned for its emerald mines. The emerald is from the same family of precious stones as aquamarine, called beryl. It contains chrome, which gives it its vivid green color. The first emeralds from this region were found by shepherds who collected them from the mountainsides to the north of the city. The emeralds found in Swat are sometimes extremely vivid in color and highly transparent. And for some people, their strong, deep color puts them on a par with Colombian emeralds, which are reputed to be the finest of all. Unfortunately, stones above two carats, that's 400 milligrams, are extremely rare. 
It's a beautiful piece, but the market for aquamarine is not very good at the moment. Emeralds are the only thing that is selling here. Try to sell it somewhere else. All right, I'll try in Peshawar. Do you have any others? Yes, I've got a lot of pieces, but they're uncut. Next time I'll bring you pieces that have been cut. Is there anything I can do for you? No, thank you, that's fine. Peshawar, the capital of the northwest province, was the gateway between Central Asia and the subcontinent. Today, it is an observation point for the conflicts that grip this region. Peshawar has been a stopping place for travelers for thousands of years. It's a city of every type of trade and commerce. Murtazar goes straight to the jewelry quarter. The gem cutters are situated in Kabul Street on his route. His main appointment in this city is with one of Pakistan's most important gem dealers, Zalmast Khan. The most beautiful crystals and the most exquisite gems are brought to him before being cut. Murtaza unwraps his treasure. selling it for. Zamast Khan doesn't hesitate for a moment. These are exactly the sort of stones he's looking for. Curiously, even though they are the most expensive, they are the easiest to sell. Wealthy collectors the world over are itching to get their hands on specimens like this. You can pay me later. No, I'll give you a deposit now and the rest later. When are you leaving? On the 22nd or the 23rd? He gives Murtaza an advance against its sale. The profits from the sale will then be shared between the two men. It's difficult to pay cash for a gem of this value, which is why they come to this arrangement. That same afternoon, Zamas Khan has done another piece of business, and he can't resist showing his friend Murtaza specimens that he has acquired from Shigar. A single piece isn't enough for me. That's why I bought these, which come from Shigar. Gul Murtaza called to let me know that he was bringing this beautiful piece. I've given him a good price for it. Other miners call me and they either come to see me or I go see them. And then we do business. The big markets are America and Europe, especially France and Germany. In the United States, we work with Tucson, Arizona. So, after this long journey, the aquamarine extracted with sweat and blood from the roof of the world is flown to Europe, the United States and Japan to be sold. The purest and most highly colored specimens will be polished by gem cutters and set into jewelry.
Here you are. The piece of jewelry is ready on time, as promised. As always. Do have a look at it. We found some very, very beautiful aquamarine pendants that we cut into briolettes. And we used this system where you can remove all of the pendants so the piece can be worn in different ways. Aquamarine, this symbol of purity, has changed the lives of the shepherds from the highest peaks of Pakistan. By opening up this paradise like a jewel box, could it be that the spirits wanted to reward the courage and tenacity of these pure souls?